item 10 to follow item 8 on the agenda. Um, is there anybody here for public comment? Do we call the roll? I can't remember. Do you call the roll? Somebody call the roll? No? Okay. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're not, if you're not here, raise, if, you're, yeah, if you're not here, raise your hand. Um, is there anybody here for public comment? Okay, hearing none, uh, we go to approval of minutes. Do we have a motion on the minutes? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That was a motion by Tatson and a second by Ornrich. And uh, next item is the consent calendar. Do we have a motion on the consent calendar? Okay, motion by Tatson. Uh, second by Bob. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. Okay, so that takes us down to our first agenda item, uh, which will be item eight, legislative update. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Happy New Year. Um, as you'll see, the report from our federal advocate covered activities uh, a little bit prior to the holidays. They also took a little bit of a holiday break, like staff and hopefully some of you. Um, and I'm, I'm anticipating that the report that you will see next month from them will be a lot lengthier than the one here um, with everything that's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, one item I wanted to point out that was not um, in this report, but something that we discussed at the last meeting was um, CCTA and Gomentum Station did apply to be a federally designated autonomous vehicle test facility. Um, and we are currently waiting to hear whether we will receive that designation or not. We're anticipating that announcement to be made in the next week or so. So we will keep you informed um, when we have any, any update on that. Through the chair. Yes. Lindsay, but my memory would serve me correctly. There was a lot of rigmarole or whatever in involving this. There was so we found it to be advantageous for us to partake of this? There, there's currently no money associated from the federal government with being a federally designated test bed, but after discussing with some of our partners at Gomentum Station um, and kind of looking into the future, we decided it would be wise to apply because there could excuse me, potentially be some funding streams in the future that go towards those facilities that are, that are designated. Randy, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or not. We were concerned about generally when the feds get involved, there's more regulations and no money. And so, for example, we had to name a safety officer, which Jack Hall has been designated as a safety officer. We have to give up some data. And when we went through our bill, AB 1592, and we added a, a data amendment, the wrath of the various tech associations came down upon us because really, nobody today really knows what that data is worth. And so these companies aren't willing to give that data up. And so we, we had to negotiate with our, our partners and, and we, we're going to give up data that is relevant to the testing. We're not giving up proprietary data. And so if there's an accident, we'd have to, we'd have to give that information, even though we're in a secure location, not under the auspices of the federal government nor the state government for that matter, uh, we, we've agreed to do some of those things and we can always turn it down at the end of the day. We don't have to accept that, that designation. So we're seeing how it plays out. <clears throat> the city of Los Angeles called us and the SANDAG, San Diego Association of Governments. They don't have a secure facility. There's not really that many secure facilities in California locations for a secure location or a facility like this. So SANDAG wants to offer up I-15, the managed lanes, they can slide the barrier over. It's a completely secure area and do high-speed testing. SR-125 is a toll road. They can close that on the weekends, and you can run vehicles up on the, on the uh, viaduct so you can't see what's happening. you got on-ramp, off-ramp, high-speed, ingress and egress. And the city of Los Angeles offers these really highly congested six, seven, or six to eight-lane arterials that we could, they want to do testing. And so we mentioned both of those, uh, city of Los Angeles, which includes LA Metro, who just passed a $120 billion measure, 40-year measure, and, uh, and Sandag, who's 
got a lot of money as well. So they're, they're pretty good partners. So we added those two to our to our application. Yeah, yes, yes, because we don't have eight lane, you know, hundreds of thousands. As, as the Commissioner Arnrich knows, those 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 are very very congested, and these vehicles are going to have to make a left turn when they got oncoming traffic. So they have to have all that sensors in place to make sure you can make that left hand turn when you got traffic oncoming traffic and no driver. So there's there's some advantages to having them with us. That was the one item that we wanted to highlight that wasn't in your report. And I know that Mark Watts, our state advocate, is here to, to give us an update on what's happening at the state level. Oh, yep, go ahead. Question, Question Ron. So on the item in the report that refer, refers to revision of Form FHWA 1273, required contract provisions, federal aid construction contracts, um, is that adding more regulations, taking regulations away? I think there's an open comment period given, or the comment period was closed. Um, is this something that was good, or was this a case of more regulation with no more money? Oh, it's the, it's the MP, MPO consolidation and the designation of only one MPO per. Well, that was, that was right? a is separate that item. This is a November 28th Federal Highway Administration oh. request of comments. So yeah. So this is, it looks like a construction contract issue if there's any federal money. I'd have to, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Off the top of my head, which is a little rusty. I don't remember exactly what that's about. Okay. We'll, we'll take a look at it and get okay. back. It appears we missed the comment period anyway. <clears throat> Any other questions on the federal report side? Okay. No, thank you. Uh, good morning uh, and Happy New Year. Look forward to a nice 2017, see how that unfolds. The last time I was here, the uh, legislative special session was being discussed and uh, eventually wound down with no action on transportation finance. Uh, but with the beginning of the new session on December 5th, we saw the two chairs introduce new legislation to, find, to fund transportation uh, shortfalls, uh, particularly on maintenance, with a focus on rehabilitation and maintenance, although both bills uh, also provide some funding for transit. Um, the other developments in the last month included uh, the uh, reappointment or redesignation of the two chairs. Uh, to fulfill the same position this year. So uh, Assemblymember Frazier is the Assembly Trans Chair. Uh, no committees have been uh, formally announced and designated yet in the Assembly, so we're waiting for that. Uh, it appears members know what committees they're on, but it's not been publicly released. In the Senate, uh, Senator Bell is retained as the Chairman of the Transportation and Housing Committee, and they have announced and released and affirmed at Senate Rules this week the committee uh, structure for the Senate, um, and uh, Contra Costa County has uh, uh, Senator Skinner, who representing portions of West County, on the committee, which is, uh, I think, uh, going to be beneficial over the long haul. Um, uh, structurally, um, in terms of the legislature, they came back yesterday, um, did a few things, and bills will start falling into place, um, being introduced in the coming uh, weeks. The final date for uh, uh, introduction of bills is, uh, I think, February 20th, or maybe the 17th. But it's at that point, that that in that uh, range of time. So we've got a lot of bills we'll be uh, reviewing and, and putting in front of staff and bringing back to you all. Uh, just a quick note on the transportation bills: um, the bills that had been in circulation last year by the two chairs were identical bills, and they would have both raised about seven, uh, close to seven and a half billion dollars. Um, the, it's notable that both authors reduced their bills. They're still very similar structurally. They rely on uh, some gas tax, some uh, diesel tax for uh, uh, trade corridor purposes, uh, registration fee. But in every case, they're smaller than what they had uh, offered in the prior year's bills. Um, 
there is a, a difference because uh, Senator Bell's uh, gas tax, uh, for example, is phased in, starting at six cents and goes to nine and twelve over three years, while Mr. Fraser's bill jumps right in at twelve cents a gallon. So there are some differences, but structurally they're very, very similar. Um, that's probably enough on the, on those bills. We'll be uh, providing more thorough analysis on them for your consideration uh, as we move forward. Uh, did participate yesterday in a meeting with uh, Chairman Frazier to talk about his plans for his bill. Uh, uh, and he's, uh, I think the world has changed a bit, uh, and he acknowledges that. When they had uh, uh, less than a supermajority over the last uh, session, the idea was uh, develop uh, a package that brought on all the Democrats and enough Republicans to pass it. But since the supermajority uh, uh, was accomplished in both houses, there's concern to protect those new members who replaced outgoing uh, minority party members. For example, Southern California, uh, several uh, Republicans were replaced by Democrats. They're viewed as uh, targets to be protected. So it makes the, the calculus on how to get a two-thirds vote as difficult, even more difficult than it was when you had less than a supermajority. So those are issues that the chairman is going to be struggling through with his leadership and with us as we move forward. Um, I might note that, uh, well, I'll cover that under the platform. There's another bill I want to bring to your attention, but it's covered under the platform discussion. So with that, I'll draw the legislative presentation to a close. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. May I have questions? Okay, thank you. So now we'll be moving to item 10, right? Yes. Uh, approval of proposed 2017 CCTA state and federal legislative advocacy program. So I'm just going to let Mark um, pick it up and keep going <laughs> on the state side, and then I'll finish with the federal one. <clears throat> um, late in 2016, I met with uh, Lindsay and others uh, to go over the 16 uh, advocacy program and look for ways we could update and, and change it. There's a few, by and large, it's a very similar structure. Uh, there are a couple of elements I want to bring your attention to. Um, one would be the second issue that's highlighted here, improve freeway operations. This would ask for your uh, support to sponsor legislation that would allow the operation on 680 of uh, uh, unique bus operations, bus on shoulder, bus on auxiliary lanes, consistent with what we've been uh, seeing emerge from the analysis uh, uh, underway here. Uh, there's a history on the bus on shoulder. Uh, there was an early success in, uh, in San Diego that was done um, administratively between the administration or the Department of Transportation and SANDAG. And subsequent to that, uh, legislation was adopted uh, for Santa Cruz and Monterey counties that hasn't been executed yet. An attempt was made last year, and you took a support position on this legislation, I believe, that made it broader, allowed some of your local transit agencies to operate bus on shoulders. But the Highway Patrol expressed concerns toward the very end, and that bill was dropped by the author. So hmm. we'd be starting from scratch, but I think we have the, uh, the, the, the data sets that we'll need to prove the case that it's going to improve traffic flow. And if we do move forward with legislation, I think we have a better chance with the study um, background that uh, we'll take to the table that wasn't there in this last go around. I'd also draw your attention on the on page 10-4. Um, we're highlighting uh, connected and autonomous vehicle policy and funding. Um, it, that's something we should be doing all along to uh, support policies that advance uh, connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, but we also have the uh, unique need now to uh, monitor, make sure nobody does uh, anything administratively or legislatively that would uh, set back AB 1592, the legislation that you all work so hard on to get through the legislature. So we'll be monitoring that very closely. There is a lot of attention in Sacramento from a variety of members on uh, autonomous vehicles in particular. And so who knows what kind of bills are going to be introduced. And so we'll be watching that very carefully. Um, in addition, um, the we're, we're look, want to emphasize project delivery improvements. There's been attempts over the years. In fact, uh, the authority sponsored 
legislation several years ago uh, on CMGC, uh, Construction Manager General Contractor, that was uh, ran into some problems with the Caltrans engineers. Nevertheless, I, we think it's, it's important to continue to support and try to advance uh, innovative delivery processes up to and including public-private partnerships where they are appropriate. So we'll be monitoring that very carefully this year and uh, bringing back bills that might be of benefit to the authority. Uh, the bill I mentioned in passing um, uh, that I'd get to is AB 28 that was introduced. That is a uh, extension of the authority from the federal government to Caltrans to um, delegate from the uh, federal um, federal government the responsibility for uh, undertaking NEPA uh, documents. Um, it had a sunset date which expired on December 1st of this year and due to uh, there was an attempt at the end of la last legislative session to extend it um, but due to technical malfunctions of the computers we weren't able to get the um, it is a very very sad story, but we were unable to get the uh, actual language uh, into into print so that we could take the bill up, and as a consequence, um, the the authority expired. Uh, Assemblymember Frazier is uh, committed to restoring this authority and has introduced AB 28, and the significance for the uh, restoration at this point in time through a very urgent process is that without that authority. NEPA documents that were nearing their end, their end of getting close to records of decision now have to be transferred back to the Federal Highway Administration. They had folded up their NEPA for California operation, so they have to reconstruct mm -hmm. uh, their oversight <coughs> before they can approve any rods. So it's going to consequently, if we do not extend it, that authority here at Cal in California, there will be delays to a number of very important rods that were uh, very close to being uh, approved. So that's a, that's a measure I think that we'll be bringing back for your support. And with that, I'll bring my discussion on the platform to a close. And actually, questions? Don? So on the uh, cap, and, on the cap and trade, I, I, as I recall, the last two auctions have yielded less than was anticipated. Is, what's the current outlook as to how future auctions will go and how is that adjusting the funding priorities? Well, there was a subsequent auction in November uh, and the final results came out in mid-December and for the funding that goes to the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is the big state pot that mm -hmm. transportation components are eligible for, uh, jumped back up to uh, about $350 million, which is closer to the 500 million that we've been seeing on a regular basis up until the two uh, the two failed <laughs> auctions, so it looks like nobody's been able to complete a full analysis of what caused that drop off. Um, there's all sorts of theories, uh, and there's work going on that. But with this now a little bit of a bounce back, I mean, 70% uh, bounce back. Everybody's waiting for the next one. There's four auctions per uh, per uh, year every quarter, so I think if we get a sustained uh, increase, I think we're off and running uh, in terms of funding for those programs. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, this is an action item. Um, and, okay. Motion by Taylor. <clears throat> Second by Tapson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. Okay. Now I think we move to Back to item nine, is that right? The what? Oh. They, they, were, they were together, but I'm happy to talk about the federal one as well if you want to vote on that oh, okay. uh, separately. I didn't see that. But but it's okay. Okay. Um, so, again, the, the platforms, both the state and the federal <laughs> platforms, are designed to be kind of a, a oh, framework sure is, or yeah. a guideline for um, individual decisions, the, the authority board. Um, and your committee retains full discretion to support or oppose any piece of legislation that we bring forward. This really serves as kind of a, a guideline for staff and our advocates in um, the, the state and in Washington, D.C. to keep their eye on things that may be relevant and to have an idea of what, what the authority is trying to move forward. Um, so similar to the state platform, the legislative platform is very similar to last year's platform. There are 
a couple new additions that I just wanted to, to highlight and bring to your attention. One, um, we've talked a lot in this body about the tax-exempt municipal bonds, which we use to finance um, our, a lot of our projects and programs. So we have specifically called those out in our federal platform to make sure that our advocates in D.C. are watching any legislation related to that and that we work to support and preserve that tool for us to help fund our projects. Um, we've also gotten a little more specific on the connected and autonomous vehicle policy and funding bullet. Um, it was very general last year, and I think now that now that um, we've gone through a year of, of working on this and we have several projects in the works, um, we're, we're watching some specific things, um, especially as it relates to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration related to some of the projects that we're looking to roll out, like the shared autonomous vehicles. And then another new item on here um, relates to mobility management and coordination. And, and really what this is saying is that we need to be looking beyond the Department of Transportation for funding opportunities. Um, one of the things our advocates brought to our attention is that the Department of Energy, um, the Department of Veteran Services, there are quite a few agencies that have pockets of money that we could potentially um, use for transportation purposes, um, you know, especially if we're providing service to certain types of medical treatments or, or other things. So um, Peter Engel, who's our, our programs manager, had said a lot of the, the services that we provide could potentially qualify. So this allows us to kind of keep our eye on maybe a little bit of a bigger picture and see if there's any, any additional pockets of money um, that we can get our hands on to, to help fund that. And I, I did actually want to add one more thing. I know Mark talked briefly about AB 28, which is uh, sponsored by the Self-Help Counties Coalition, and that's actually um, something that we would be looking to, to get a tentative support position on from your group today to take to the authority board um, because it is an urgent item, and we know that you know giving California back that NEPA delegation will help make sure that we're able to deliver all of our projects on time, not just from the authority level, but from the city and the county level as well. So I guess that's potentially an, an addition to the staff recommendation is to approve the platforms and also uh, take a support position on AB 28. Any questions on that, Don? So um, on the federal policy, I know, you know none of us knows what is going to happen in Washington in the next couple of years, but one of the rumors is there'll be some sort of regulatory reform. and. We have commented from time to time that the federal government creates a lot of regulations, particularly compared to the amount of money they provide. And I'm just wondering if there is a, another category we ought to introduce into this is to identify the areas where we think regulatory reform is appropriate and lobby for those because maybe there's an opportunity this year. You know, that's a great point. We, we have had a conversation about the regulation reform. The regulation reform that we pushed for was letter of no prejudice, which is in the FAST Act. You can do design work through the environmental process now, where it used to not be eligible if you design too much. So we've gotten pretty effective at putting that in. One of the things that we have talked about, and we should maybe put this in, is the idea that currently the feds delegate to the State Department of Transportation to process our E76s, and it takes months. It's so one of the things that we talked about is getting the authority, because I'm pretty sure LA Metro is going to want, not want to wait, you know, six months to invest their dollars and wait for an E76 that's approved by Caltrans. Let us take the risk. We have the dollars to back, back it if we make a mistake. If we don't, then we get reimbursed like we should. Now, I, I think that was one of the things that we've talked about, Lindsay and I at least, and, and Ross when he was here, about trying to figure out ways of streamlining that process. So maybe we needed to put a broad kind of a, regulation reform box in there. We'll add that in as an amendment to, to the motion, and we'll try to it's, – it's hard for us to define exactly what the problems are, but there are many. Right. But I think just to uh, – and then for that, I would move adoption of this, including sponsorship of AB. Newell had a question, I think. No, I was, I was going to just echo that, and oh, okay. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. So uh, motion by Tatson, second by Arner. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, none opposed. Okay, now we move to nine. Item nine. Authorization to execute amendment number one to agreement 443 with Tyler Technologies for human resources and payroll 
system and cloud hosting services. Good morning, APC Chair Butt. Uh, my name is Randy Carlton. I'm the CFO for the Authority, I'm also responsible for IT and technology in the organization. Um, staff is seeking approval of this contract amendment with Tyler Technologies to add uh, the HR payroll module to our existing Tyler financial uh, base. Um, you know, we have a partnership with Tyler Technologies that dates back to 2008 when we implemented the financial system. Um, prior to 2008, um, you know, we uh, relied on the county to process our transactions, to pay our vendors, to maintain our general ledger. Um, and it was oftentimes up to the county's um, workload and their priorities as to whether or not the authorities' items would receive attention, timely attention. Uh, we decided a better way was to implement our own financial system, and we did a, an exhaustive search of companies and selected a, uh, a company called New World at the time. It is now called Tyler Technologies. Um, you know, that decision enabled us, and it really did empower us to uh, establish our own business policies, our own business practices. Uh, we became self-sufficient. We uh, replaced paper processes with electronic workflows we began doing things faster. We began paying our vendors much faster than we otherwise could under the county system. Um, so what we're suggesting today is instead of maintaining, you know, two systems, one for our financials and a separate one for our payroll, which is managed through a company called ADP, um, Tyler Technology has an HR payroll module. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of these um, ERP systems uh, in your own local agencies. Well, currently, our ADP system does not talk to our financial system. And uh, through the single platform offered to us by Tyler, we can have an HR payroll system that integrates with our financials so that things that we're having to do manually today, um, such as you know, post the payroll to our general ledger and, and uh, cut checks to the benefit providers, uh, we're doing some of that stuff manually that will be replaced uh, automatically. Uh, we'll also be able to provide our users with a single, um, you know, desktop view to see uh, not only what is happening on the financial side of the shop, but also to see what uh, is happening on, on payroll. Uh, so there's a lot of benefit to having, you know, one uh, technology provider to provide for all of our um, back office systems, and we believe uh, Tyler is the right partner since we've already uh, invested in them and, and are pleased with their product. They have good customer support. Um, our staff is familiar with, with, with the company and, and involved in their user group uh, organization. Um, so uh, what we did for the authority's financial system, we're proposing we can do for the authority's HR and payroll system and become more efficient and faster and, and, and accurate. As you can imagine, maintaining two systems you have a potential for error uh, when we're having to, to manually enter transactions, uh, and, and, and that would be you know, significantly reduced when you have one system you know, communicating with, with the other. Um, the, uh, the other feature of it is that you may recall in September we uh, approved a plan to move our financial system into the cloud, and, and that was uh, completed successfully. We no longer have any servers on site here. Uh, we communicate with um, uh, Tyler through just any uh, ordinary desktop to where um, all the information is hosted on their servers um, that we access through the Internet. This, the HR payroll system would, be, uh, would function the same way. It would be maintained by Tyler, and um, um, we uh, would have the benefit of not having to purchase any, any uh, any servers. Um, the, the cost factor here is that, you know, there's some one-time cost. There's some one-time cost for the licensing. There's some one-time cost for the implementation services. Um, that totals about $91,000. There's some ongoing cost uh, that we otherwise would be paying anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, of about $9,500 for the, for the cloud hosting to maintain our system. Um, we're paying uh, ADP now. Um, you know, ADP isn't a bad solution. It just isn't a very good fit for public agencies. It's, uh, it's more, it's, it's, 
more commonly found in, in, in small to large uh, businesses, and uh, it wasn't designed for public agencies, and there's some, some limitations in using that system. We can make it work, but um, it's clunky for us, and we're having to do things manually that otherwise could be done automatically. Um, we would be uh, eliminating that cost of about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars that we're paying ADP now um, by going in the proposed direction. Um, we've also done some things uh, in our staff um, to uh, to reorganize slightly, reduce costs. We've uh, recently um, uh, downgraded a position from a senior accountant to accounting specialist. Uh, we have some cost savings from that, and. Um, with the addition of, of Terry Ann, who has some, some HR background, we're looking to involve her in, in, in more, more so in the organization in doing uh, HR processing. So uh, with, with that, this is an action item. We're, we're seeking approval of this contract amendment. And uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to address them. Questions? Yeah, Lou? Um, thank you, uh, Randy. I, I, <coughs> principal, I think it's a great idea um, that has a 39-year business owner. Um, the concern I have is, is payroll is one of the riskiest portions in any, any business, and I don't care how big you are. Um, you miss a due date, you miss anything on tax, <clears throat> tax filings, the penalties are severe. And every organization, our, ourselves included, when we did, and given we're a small organization, when we pulled payroll in-house, the labor factor was huge. It just is. The reality is it's it's not – software doesn't solve that. That just helps the accounting, and that's just a spreadsheet integration. Um, this is effectively $38,000 a year with a $16,000 of travel, $100,000. Um, you spread this over five years, which is its value. And so our net cost is ten dollars to $15,000 a year. How much more labor do we really see, to be honest about it? Because it's not going to be able to be done with the same amount of effort that we have now. The payroll is not as easy as anybody. They haven't done it lately. It's a pain to do. Um, the software just keeps the math in order. That's all it does. doesn't make it easier. doesn't mean that it doesn't take time to do. It doesn't save you any time at all. That going from where right now on an ADP we're basically, because most of our people are salaried, you put in there, here's their pay, here's what they get, and, and they, they can keep track of vacations and all that, whatever you want, whatever level of service you want. So how much more labor are we going to spend to do this? Since we've got a ten to 15000 that increase, how much more labor are we going to put in? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing up that point. I felt to, to address upon there is additional risk. Uh, we will be paying our own uh, employment taxes. You know, when you look at the payroll process, it is, um, you know, labor intensive, and we are looking to um, reduce the time it takes for us to do payroll. Um, I've, I've uh, discussed this with, with, with some of our peers who have implemented similar systems going from an ADP system to, to a, a Tyler HR, HR payroll system, and they've reduced their staffing time by 50 percent in the processing of, of payroll because um, – you know, ADP is not the best fit for, for, oh, for public agents. And, just, and uh, you know, we, we do, you know, 95% of the work uh, you know, already uh, and, and merely you know, provide ADP with a file and say, okay, print the checks and pay the taxes. Well, if we bring that in-house, we can we could, we could save save the time that we, otherwise we are already, we're already preparing the payroll. Yeah. So why not do it, you know, ourselves and um, pay the taxes our ourselves and to uh, you know take on that additional risk but we are saving time in how we process payroll and the, by comparison of uh, and the other agencies I've talked to you they've reduced their time by 50 percent and, and I agree with you about the ADP part we unfortunately used ADP for a while and it was the worst financial mistake we ever made um, it became labor intensity we use um, through our bank um, uh, their payroll <laughs> services and it reduced our time to about one hour a month. And they do 100% of everything. So my question is, we, we're looking at it relative to ADP. Are we, did we look at to say, is there somebody who can handle the payroll function, do an integration? Um, because I can get an electronic file now into our booking, keeping, boom, it posts. 
I don't have to do anything. They just post automatically. So they do the integration for us because we have to have a major brand software and it integrates perfectly. So did we look at that as an alternative or? Yeah. We, and we have done some of that. We're, we're able to export a file from ADP and, and use that um, to import into our financial system for the basic financial tra transactions that we need to post to our, our general ledger. But what it will not do um, is, for example, it will tell you what a payroll of the payroll is, the, the, the dollar number, but it won't tell you, you know, the, the who, what, and why. Okay. You know, no, I, I agree. ADP. Number. My question was, I'm sorry, was I, I would not, I don't think ADP's capability works well. Did we look at um, another payroll service along with getting the HR module? Um, was that a consideration? Did you um, that, that was a consideration, but we believe that we can, we can, we're already partnered with, with Tyler and we're already okay. attending their conferences and in their user group and they have a product and a solution that works together. It's all designed yeah. to work together. Have we seen, have we talked to another agency that actually has that new module in and did they go from some other? Yes, I, I spoke with um, a Middle Peninsula Open Space Authority, an organization that's that similar in size and experience. They, they went uh, from an ADP, they were existing Tyler customer on the financials and they added the HR payroll uh, replacing ADP and um, they, they're grateful that they did it because okay. it is saving a lot That's of a time good story. Okay. Uh, and, and it is a, good, a very good story um, to, to tell. They, yeah. they reduce their, their staffing time on how they do payroll by okay. 50%. Perfect, perfect, perfect answer. Thank you for that. Did you have something? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I had to step out there. Um, my question now: How much? How much is now the Tyler contract? How much is the the what? The, 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 the Tyler contract in total? Total now. Yeah. Um, so we're spending about um, twelve thousand dollars a year now for um, the uh, cloud support. You know, they maintain the software, they apply the updates, they 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 they, they keep it running for us. Um, then there's an additional uh, $15,000 for the, s the software support uh, that we're, we're spending. So it's about $25,000 a year in total. And I guess what I got, the final question on this, and I'm kind of going with what Newell was saying, staff training now, is there, or is there going to be any training or should there be? Um, the, the training educational part, part of it. Uh, training is included in this. You know, as a part of the implementation, they'll they'll train us on how to use the system, and then on an annual basis, we'll we'll we'll, we'll be a participants in the user conferences. We've actually hosted a user conference here in our boardroom. Uh, you know, for the financial uh, application, we'll continue that partnership with with the user group and keep our employees you know plugged into the the, the latest changes. And then the final question, and it's just, just for me to learn a little bit here. To me, the way we were doing it, two separate ways and everything, I kind of felt that we were probably behind the times. Of, do we have any more archaic issues <laughs> with uh, <laughs> with uh, financial type stuff because, you know, technology is changing? But I feel that's pretty archaic. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, um, so you know, I need that, to know, Randy, where where are we going? With, yeah. uh, um, are, you, are you on top of this? That that uh, comment reminded me of a of a comment made by a, a former commissioner, um, you know, who's uh, no longer with us. But uh, he he said when we uh, implemented the financial system, he says, "Well, it's time for the, the authority. You know, we grow up and we start doing things like a like a you know like a big boy." And um, <laughs> that was. Uh, and, and then we moved forward, and we, we we broke away from the county, and we set up our own our own shop. But uh, you know, to, to answer your question, um, I, I I you know, this is the last piece of our you know of our technology plan, and uh, you know, it would be a fully integrated um, platform uh, supported by one company. Um, and uh, you know, you're right; things constantly change, and and we'll be mindful of that. If there's something else, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to come back and, and uh, bring it to your attention.
and uh, there's really? nothing on, on the immediate horizon. Um, so just to make sure, do you use ADP or any other consultants for the HR questions that you don't know in-house, and, and, and are we losing a service by making this transition? Um, there is some, some services that uh, we'll be looking to, to replace. Um, you know, ADP has, um, has a, train, a suite of training uh, that um, we find that some of it works and some of it doesn't necessarily work for, for, for us. Um, we're, um, we, we have training available to us through, through other sources uh, that we'd be tapping into. You know, there's there's skill based training you know for things like word and excel and and then there's there's other trainings such as uh, workplace harassment and we're um, also putting together a new training program on on ethics and uh, uh, so we would be you know looking for a, a, a repl you know somebody to help us with 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 that element of the training cool. um, well with that I'd be willing to uh, vote for Randy in this case and support um, moving forward with the Tyler HR payroll integration and look forward to hearing back from you and how it goes. Okay. Second. Okay. Motion <coughs> Motion by Arnrich, second by Paskew. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed? So that brings us down to commission and staff comments and I have, I'm going to be at the New Partners for Smart Growth, February 2nd, our next meeting, so I will not be here. And I don't have an alternate either because my alternate's gone and, well, I guess I may have one by then. Um, WICTAC will be meeting, I guess, the last Friday of this month and we'll probably be selecting another alternate, so. Right, yeah, well, that, that the alternate would normally chair it anyway, but they right. would be in attendance if need, need be. Um, okay, any any other commissioners comments? Yeah, welcome to our new commissioner. <laughs> okay. so, uh, one comment here and response. Good morning, commissioners, to uh, Commissioner Thompson's question earlier. We did a quick search here on the internet regarding these yeah. changes being done to this form. So uh, FHWA form 1273 is a form that we had to, by the requirements of any federal aid project, put into our construction contracts to the contractor. They have to follow them, and we're not allowed to make any changes once it's been adopted by virtue of these comments here. And by looking at these comments right here that are being entertained, it looks like for agencies like ours, uh, we're just changing the definition of what constitutes discrimination and they're expanding it from just sex discrimination and they're expanding it to sexual orientation and gender identity, so that's prohibited now. In addition to that, they are expanding uh, where the Davis-Bacon Act is being used, so that's probably an additional requirement for, for small agencies like ours, where, you know, as you know, the Davis-Bacon Act is the prevailing wage uh, requirement in federal contracts, and there's a very limited exclusion as to when these apply. So uh, like uh, Executive Director Randy and I were talking about, that's primarily the reason why we try to shift money around when we're in this agency so that we use federal funds for uh, uses other than construction contracts so we don't have to necessarily oblige by a lot of these requirements or comply with them. And it looks like the last major change that they are entertaining here uh, was uh, bringing, bringing into line the language of these requirements with existing law as it, as it relates to uh, Clean Water, Clean Air Act and also the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. So I just align them closer so there's no uh, any issues regarding interpretation. So that's the extent that, that I see here as being uh, anything major changes that, as it relates to agencies like ours. One clarifying comment on that. We try to aggregate our federal money on one project in construction. So that way we don't have all this disparate federally, federalized construction projects out there. The, the other thing is they're trying to define a trail project as on a federal aid system. So that would be more for, would be like a local agency trying to build a trail extension. You may have to go through all this federal, if you get a federal grant, you're gonna have to federalize your trail project. So 
that's not that's not that's not going to be easy, right? So that's generally why we take all that federal money and replace it with measure money. Okay. Good. No. I, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Jack um, Hall, who uh, was kind enough to give me a tour at our gum medical station, and. Uh, to get in our, our new uh, autonomous vehicles. Now, we didn't get to actually ride in them, although I did try to start them. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, it's pretty exciting. It's uh, amazing um, how complicated it was to get the right to do this. But when you're out there and you can see how you have this open, really secure, secluded environment of every kind of road condition you can imagine, um, I just encourage, if you haven't been out there, um, go out there, but try to do it when, when you're seeing one of the agencies out there. Obviously, the cars that are out there, they're stored there, are the ones going into Bishop Branch, the French cars. And these are totally autonomous. No steering wheels, no brake pedals. Um, it does have emergency buttons in there, so as a passenger, <laughs> you could stop. It has a variety of things, um, but pretty exciting stuff. So really just want to thank Jack and our partners that help run that agency. Okay. I've got one. Yeah. One quick comment I wanted to make. You heard about the loss of NEPA delegation effective January 1st. I would just like to note that I was able to get my two outstanding NEPA documents signed in December <laughs> with the assistance of Caltrans staff who worked through the holidays, one for the um, I-680 express lane project environmental document and for 242 Clayton Road environmental document. Well done. Uh, Chair Bad, I actually have one additional comment as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Arnert's comments reminded me of this. We, we are planning again to host a summit on redefining mobility in the next generation of technology. So mark your calendars for March 30th, 2017. And we are planning to host it at the Roundhouse Conference Center in Bishop Ranch this year. And um, in part because we're looking to potentially have some live demonstrations um, of of autonomous vehicles as well so that folks can get up close and personal with them. So we'll be um, providing you with more information, but this is just a little save the date reminder. Okay, any other business? Going once, going twice. Next meeting, uh, Thursday, February 2nd, 2017. We are adjourned. So Lindsay, that's the thing I went to last Send out more info. Oh, okay.